thank you for uh, coming out on a early Monday morning, etc. And welcome to our, our copyright, copyright session. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, the co-panel right along with me. I'm Ross Mutton. Uh, I used to be a director of Instructional Media Services, was involved with copyright issues, or have been in, involved with copyright issues since about 1985, so I guess that's 20 some odd years. I'm still acting uh, in a consultant role with the university on copyright issues. Uh, this is Heather Cross from uh, the... I'm from the library. <laughs> yeah, she's, I, know she, I know you're from the library, <laughs> yes. <laughs> trying to remember the man, the Joy McLaren Center is what yeah. I was trying to get. Yeah. I work with students with disabilities and have a little adaptive technology center in the library. And Ingrid Dreyer is with the library and she's going to talk about the video side of things. Mm -hmm. And into library loans. And Joanne Rummick is uh, going to talk to us about reserves. She's with the library as well. And Terry Goodwin down at the end is from Graphic Services and going to talk about course packs. Uh, we're going to try and keep this as sort of a round table, kind of, so we're not going to pop up and do a presentation. We have PowerPoint just to see if it sort of keep us on track. And But we're just going to sit here and, and talk about the different issues. Uh, feel free to interrupt and ask questions at any point. We'll try and stop, I guess, at each topic and see if there are any questions, and then we'll sh move the microphone on to whoever's speaking next. We are being recorded for people who weren't able to come out at 10.30 on a Monday morning. So we shall get started. Um, so we're going to talk about, uh, first of all, Photocopying, which may seem rather old and boring, but still is an, is an issue uh, because we have a license with access copyright, so we want to we want to cover that. And photocopying certainly still does happen on campus. Uh, Terry's going to talk about course packs. Ingrid and I are going to talk about some issues around the use of video. Uh, Heather's going to talk about the alternate formats for persons with perceptual disabilities. I'm going to talk about classroom presentation issues. Um, and Joanne's going to talk about library reserves, and I'm not sure whether Ingrid or Joanne is going to talk about digital. Ingrid? Anyway, digital copyright yes. issues. Um, well, okay. are between you and me, I guess. Yeah. And interlibrary loan. Uh, I'll touch on thesis, and I'll talk about where the legislation changes are or are not going. So, <clears throat> first of all, what is copyright? And Copyright law protects the expression of uh, intellectual property. So it refers to things that have been, what they say sometimes in the law, has been fixed. So it refers to print works, um, multimedia works, video, audio, uh, material you find on the web, any kind of recording, something that you can actually distribute and make copies of. Um, a verb our, if we were not being recorded today, our verbal presentation would not have copyright because it hadn't been recorded. But because there was a video recording happening, our presentation is being uh, recorded and thus has copyright. And the copyright owners of that are the five of us. And technically, nobody can make a copy without our permission. So that's and so the the, the copyright law exists to protect the rights of the the, the creator. And the, only the creator has the right to distribute the material or make copies of the material. Now, they can assign those rights to other people, but uh, that's the, the, the rights rest primarily and initially with the creator. And you do not have to register the copyright in Canada. It's, it's an automatic right. So you, you, there are ways of registering it, but it's not necessary. So I want to go on to, first of all, talk about uh, photocopying and what we can do here at Carleton with photocopying. We have an agreement with Access Copyright. Access Copyright is a collective that represents the rights of the publishers. And the university um, pays an annual fee to Access Copyright for what we call um, general, you know, uh, one-time use, photocopying, etc., and so that it permits photocopying for purposes in class and for other purposes uh, like uh, the operation of the institution. There are some limits on how much can be copied. 
basically it's no more than 10% of an entire work or one entire newspaper article, one short story, play, poem, essay, or article, because it doesn't make sense to chop those up into little bits, like 10% of a short story. Uh, you can uh, photocopy an item of print music if it's found in a book or periodical, but you can't copy sheet music. Now, the only people that really are concerned about that usually are, are, is the music department. Uh, you can copy a, an entire entry from an encyclopedia or dictionary and an entire uh, artistic work. In other words, if a uh, painting or a work of art has been uh, printed in a textbook, or not a textbook, or any kind of book, uh, you can make a copy of the entire work. It doesn't make sense to uh, show 10% of the pieta. And uh, in a chapter of a book, you can, so the 10% rule applies to a book, but you can actually go beyond the 10% if a chapter exceeds the 10%, but no more than 20% of the total text. Because most texts probably have an, enough chapters that a chapter doesn't actually get beyond 20% of, of the text itself. Um, there are some different rules for textbooks uh, other than the standard books. So it's a little more restrictive. It's no more than 5% or a single chapter of a textbook. And you can't copy more than two extracts from text by the same author and publisher within five years. And no more, Terry will talk a little bit about this a little later, but uh, no more than 50% of a, of a course pack can be taken from textbooks. It can be taken from other kinds of works, but not, you know, no more than 50% from, uh, from a textbook. So those are the general rules um, for photocopying. And so the, this applies to works that are photocopied and handed out to students, or you know, especially in a, in a short period of time, like you don't have time to deal with a course pack, but you need something that just may have happened, or just a short work, something that you spotted in a, public, you know, in a, in a journal, or in a uh, magazine, etc. For work that is to be copied and and sold to students as a course pack, there's the course pack process, which involve, which Terry's going to talk about in a minute. Uh, the entire access copyright license is available on the Carleton website. It's, it's housed in the uh, library, interlibrary loan section. And so we've put the link in the handout, etc. And so you can see there um, the whole agreement, uh, the various clauses, and there are uh, restrictions. There are a number of publishers that are not covered under the agreement, and they are listed in a document that's kept up to date. So that's all available there. So I'll stop right now and ask if there are any questions about uh, photocopying. Yes? So it's hard to say. I mean, I, you know, I, I would probably give you the, the benefit of the doubt. Um, where we get, if I suspect, you know, just thinking off the top of my head, if all of those three extracts were in both editions, then that's probably not, you know, kosher. Yeah. Yeah. So. I would, but other, you know, if I think there's differences of what you're copying from the two editions, then probably you would treat them as separate uh, works. Yeah, it's a, you know, it's a guideline. I, you know, so and if you have any questions, you can always contact us on that. But I would, I would tend to think that they would be treated separately, unless you were taking material that was identical from both and trying to sort of bend the rule. <laughs> yes. Um. Um, there is actually a definition of, of textbooks. I don't think I, um, I brought it with me. 
uh, and I'm trying to remember whether I don't know if we even have it on the on the website, but generally uh, they talk. I mean, it's, it's fairly straightforward. I mean, it, basically, it's material or books that have been designed to be used for courses, and so and ones that are produced edition after edition. Um, they, uh, you know, are, what, else, what can I say? Yeah. Well, what, what are you thinking? Are they being published by publishers that traditionally produce textbooks? Uh, well, university presses, but not. Um, yeah, you, I mean, university. My thoughts on that is university presses don't necessarily produce works that are they're destined to be a textbook. So, because they're, they're a little more scholarly or whatnot, it's uh, it. Thinking more along the lines of Nelson and Pearson and um, uh, McGraw Hill, etc. But uh, I mean, if you want to contact me, I can I can give you some of the guidelines that they have on what they refer to as a textbook. What field are you in? Uh, history. Yeah. Okay. So there was a question. Yes. Like if the book is 1,000 pages, 5% would mean 50 pages. So you can photocopy 50 pages uh, with no problem. And that 50 pages may cover two chapters, or it's just only one chapter? Uh, no, it could be, you know, the, the 50 pages could be any any combination of pages within the, the, and the book. And what does it mean on a single chapter? A single chapter may be only 20 pages, so one can copy two chapters, 20 pages each? Yeah, you, so, so you, the rule is uh, whichever is more, so uh, it's, it's either five percent. So you have, you know, as you say, like, like fifty pages. So that would be the max. So you could you could do more than one chapter as long as it didn't exceed the five percent, or you can do the one chapter, which could exceed the five percent, and be more than fifty pages. So whichever one is more. No, you're not limited to one chapter. You're limited to either 5% of the total or to one chapter, whichever is greater. Whichever is greater. Um, and you also mentioned about uh, that our university has some agreement with the publishers for, for photocopying material. Uh, well, this is for photocopying. Yes. Okay. So photocopying for handout purposes. Yes. For, for producing textbook or course packs, Terry's going to talk about how that works. Okay, and it might help once we've gone through the rest of it. So, were there any other questions? Let me just talk about fair dealing for a second. Um, and so, you, you want to look at it. I may come back to this as well, but there is a fair dealing provision within the Act that allows for copying purposes for private study and research, criticism and review, and for news reporting. Uh, the news reporting you're not particularly interested in unless you're in the School of Journalism, but the first two uh, give you some ability to make copy to, to make a copy of a work. Uh, so the students can make a, a single copy of a work for their own private study and research purposes. Provide, you know, and I, the caveat being that this should be something that they're doing as an optional, not as a mandatory issue. Um, you can make a copy of I probably we would suggest uh, within the classroom for yourself for criticism and review purposes. And there's also some other provisions within the act to let you display the work on, on a screen. So I we do have I've put in a link and put in a lot more information about about the fair dealing provisions within the act. There's a lot of controversy about, you know, what 
people can and can't do under fair dealing uh, because the users on one side see a certain ability. The creators uh, have some concerns about the interpretation of fair dealing and certainly access copyright and AUCC and the university probably don't agree on fair dealing but we all agree there is fair dealing. So I've, you, know, you might want to have a look at, uh, I've, I've updated our website considerably over the summer on the provisions of fair dealing and that link is in your handout. So we're going to move on to course pack so I'm going to take the microphone down to Terry. Um, I guess I'll get you to advance them then, Ross. This gives you what is a course pack, what is required, and what uh, the professor wants. Um, yeah, I can see some of it with that. Um, complication of the material, what the professor wants or the TA wants in the manual form, uh, covers the topics that the instructors want, um, gives you a custom reader on what the professors want. Um, best use is class handouts, let it see the uh, copyright, what Ross was talking about. Uh, when reserved material is av unavailable, damaged or missing, that's been the case this year uh, past, this term past, where a lot of professors were tired of the reserve, students couldn't get to it, so they were making up course packs. Um, desire again to tailor the material, and materials uh, are unpublished or out of print, we'll get uh, copyright clearance for stuff like that and get them uh, into a course pack. The procedures and the process is preparation, um, and then we get uh, copyright permission. Uh, we require the book format and the layout that the professors want, and then we go ahead and print and assembly uh, the course packs as required by the professor. This gives you an idea of the uh, limitations on what's allowed. 15% of a work or one chapter that does not exceed 20%, again, whichever is gr greater. Or 5% of a textbook or a single chapter not exceeding 50% of the pages of the whole textbook. What we require is uh, preparation of material for, we need the author, the article name, the title, and importantly the ISBN number, publisher, year, and the pages, total pages in the books used and page ranges used. Um, materials uh, that exceed these limits must be reduced and we'll, otherwise we'll have to try and apply for clearance from copyright, access copyright. So we uh, put everything together uh, to ensure that compliance with our licensing with permission, when permission is required for items outside the agreement, yeah, it does take a few days to get clearance. And it's normally, uh, again, a busy time of year for access copyright dealing with everything across Canada. Um, if the permission is de denied, the course back uh, will require, uh, give that information to the uh, professors and let them decide on what to cut down when producing the course back if they're over the limits. Uh, during the f preparation of the format and the layout, we'll ask uh, what's required. Single, double-sided um, covers are available in different uh, colors or normally it's cardstock material. Um, type of binding that's required. Some of the course backs are quite large, so we have to go to a Surlox binding. Uh, whether dividers are needed, page numbering, and trying uh, number of copies to be produced. Uh, so they're all printed and packaged and delivered to the university bookstore. And we provide a rain check system so that we can get uh, when there's no more copies available on the shelves, we'll reproduce rain checks within 72 hours. Normally, before that, if uh, we can get access to the printers and get everything out quickly. 
these are our uh, dates to remember as far as submission to uh, to us for the uh, terms coming up. They're not in stone. We keep receiving course packs right up to the start of the term because again it's a situation where some professors are assigned courses and try and get together a course pack at a later at a close date to the beginning of the class and we'll do our best to get them in into the book produced and into the bookstore. Uh, we deal with a first come first serve priority as best we can. Uh, Kathy Dumont does the copyright clearance for us and I produce the course back so uh, the cleaner we get it in the better the product we, I can produce and put out to the uh, bookstore and produce. So that's pretty well a quick of what we do with the course packs. Questions on course packs? I think this is what you are talking about is more or less, uh, I tell you I want uh, this page is from my book and this is, and you photocopy those pages. Yeah. What if I have a part which is handwritten? Can you also type it in and add it to the course pack in the place that I ask you to do? Yeah, normally we hope the professor will do that because of time constraints for us to try and do all that. Probably better you would uh, copy it and print it out for us because my interpretation of the handwriting might not be exactly right or something. Yeah. Easier, uh, easier if I get a clear copy of what you want produced and then I can photocopy and continue on. Produced by yourself, you mean, or somebody else? No, I, I write it, but I follow it, a certain book, maybe two books, where, you know, there's a certain order and uh, some definitions which are pretty standard, uh, and there, there are parts which are standard that can be found anywhere. There are examples which I can take or not take from the book. How does this come? I believe, I believe if you write it, is that right, Ross? Uh, there's no uh, copyright? I do not copy pages from a text, but I take some parts from it, sometimes. I, it's very difficult to count how much I take, I mean, literally, but some parts. Is, is it go, does it go according to the same count? It should not exceed 5% altogether, or? Uh, so you're taking, you know, taking snippets of the work? So I have a textbook to follow, but I yeah. do not follow it literally. I, I, I write my own notes for, for students. Yeah, your own notes are your property. Yeah, that's what I believe. So they're yours. But if you're, if you're just copying substantial portions of other work, yeah, that's submitting that, that's, that's, that would still be subject to copyright. Yeah, your notes have to have some intellectual input. So if you're writing a note, that's one thing. If you're just copying what they wrote and Taking like this paragraph and this paragraph and this paragraph, that's not your work, that's their work. Yes. So it's, so if you're just copying what they wrote, then that's the subject of copyright. If you are modifying it, then you know that's your work. It's that's an easy way of doing it. But if it, this is extra post, which usually is the case. Yeah. And the answer to that is it depends. <laughs> so you might want to, so you might, you might want to ask them or ask me.
Um, I have some handouts over there on the video service to do with Interfilm, which is one part of our video service. Um, in 07, the library took over the video uh, service and collection from the Instructional Media Services. Just move this over. which we keep at the circulation desk, um, which can be um, uh, borrowed. It can be booked in advance of the show date if you have a lecture that you want uh, for a particular time period. Um, it can be booked for that, um, and it can be borrowed for a longer uh, period than the three days that um, you normally would get. Um, all of the material in our video collection um, is licensed for public performance rights. Um, except maybe one or two things and if they aren't licensed it's specified in the library record when you look it up but it's pretty much 99 percent all uh, public performance rights which means it costs us more to buy them normally um, in some cases because the the vendor um, that we're buying it from knows it's for public performance and that's kind of once we buy it with that it's good it has that forever um, if we don't buy it with that, it's because it's covered by our blanket licensing. There are two companies that we buy um, annual licensing from, and that's for the more um, commercial um, releases like Hollywood films, um, foreign films, Canadian films. Um, they're both of them, and I'm going to show you the website in a minute um, where you can check um, whether something's covered or not. And certainly before we order a video, we look to see if we're already covered by our blanket licensing before we pay for the public performance rights. So we have to make that decision at the point of ordering it. Um, we also have a, um, a, a larger group that we borrow videos from. Um, it's um, called Watt Media. That's the catalog. It's a group called Interfilm, and it's other Ontario University libraries. And we have an interlending service with them. Um, and the website can lead you to that as well. Um, and so if we don't have it in our collection, we can get it for you um, from another university library. And the handouts that I have over there um, will tell you who to contact for that. Um, we also have videos on reserve. Some professors want videos put on reserve. Um, those don't necessarily need public performance rights if it's just for a student to, to watch privately. Um, it would only be if it was going to be used in the classroom that that would come into it. Um, so sometimes it's our material put on reserve, sometimes it's professor-owned videos. Um, whether you can show a video that you own yourself or whether you get it from another a blockbuster or a public library, again, you can check whether it's covered by our blanket licensing by checking those two sites. Um, or if you're really in doubt, you can ask. Um, uh, my, my email address is, is right in there to ask if, if you can use it um, or not. And um, if, it, if it isn't secured for public performance rights, you may not be able to use it in the classroom. Any questions so far? Yes? Uh, oh, yeah, I'll ask now. Um, what about using YouTube links in class? Sometimes the stuff that goes up on YouTube is not legally there that like someone may put up. What's the ramifications of using that in that context? I'll let Ross handle that one. <laughs> uh, generally, we say that if it's available on the web, um, you can use it in class. Uh, if you know it's it's you know completely illegal, um, you probably shouldn't do it. But it kind of depends on uh, what. Uh, you know how much your knowledge is, but it's really YouTube's responsibility to take something down if it's not supposed to be there. Uh, so you're not probably in so much trouble with YouTube as you are with other kinds of sites, etc., that would be around. Because YouTube has been in the last year or so has been pretty uh, diligent about taking material down if the uh, rights holder complains. So they, they've been actually doing that. I'll get to that. Um, I'm trying to remember the ways. Yeah, so that's that's in general. I think what I would I would advise on the use of of material. I know I, I was going to say there is a um, movement afoot to ensure that what's used or what's displayed in the classroom from the web uh, becomes legal. 
Uh, technically, uh, some people think it's not legal at the moment. I tend to think it is, and I don't agree with AUCC on the subject, and some faculty uh, associations, certainly CAUT doesn't agree with AUCC on the whole subject. It, um, so I can talk a little more about that when we get to the legislation part, but I would, and my advice right now, if it's on the web and it doesn't look like it's blatantly in, you know, an illegal copy, then go ahead and, and use it on, in, by displaying it in the classroom. This is from the library website, um, and it'll tell you everything you need to know about use, finding videos and using videos. Um, you can, um, if it's from our catalog, you're going to be just um, searching for it in the catalog. Sorry. I'm a lefty, so this is really awkward. Uh, um, and then um, borrowing them from Carlton, booking them, and you can do this all online from home. You don't have to come in to do any of this. Um, and as I mentioned, going outside of Carlton, going to Watt Media, there's a link to Watt Media you can check there. Um, and all of the information I've just told you is all contained in here. And what I want to show you most is the licensing for public performance. Um, we have the links to Audio Sin and Criterion. That's where you would look to see if we already are licensed to show that. Uh, it's very easy to search. You just go to the site and there's a place where you can type the title of the movie. And if it comes up with a hit, it means we're covered for it. So it's, um, it's a handy place to check if, you know, the thing you want to bring from home or the thing you want to borrow from the public library is, is covered. Uh, Criterion is the one for the more the Hollywood type of uh, big release videos. Um, Audio Sin is for Canadian films mostly and foreign films and documentaries. Um, if they're covered on there, otherwise we would have to, of course, pay for that performance rights when we buy it. Any questions? I saw in one of the slides there was a line, can you show TV clips? Yes. <laughs> Ross is going to talk about that next. And what about a professor's lectures when they are taped in class? Who has the copyright? Faculty member. Well, yeah, faculty member. If my lecture is taped, it is my CD? Yeah. Who's taping it? ITV. ITV? Yeah, we need so. I mean, you can, there are uh, provisions within the QASA agreement that sort of lay all that out. And in fact, I think it's, uh, I think you'll find it on uh, our general IMS uh, copyright website. There's a link to the portion of the QASA agreement. But in, but in general, uh, the copyright uh, exists with the, the faculty member first and foremost. I mean, the university has some ownership as well because it's done the recording, etc. But the university can't make use of the material without the the consent of the faculty member. The faculty member is the is the prime rights holder. That's my understanding. Uh, did you cover yes. everything you wanted there? Talk about off-air taping issues, and then yeah, we'll talk about clips and and sort of how murky that is, and how my thinking is changing. And <laughs> see if we can get everybody into trouble. Um, there is a collective called the Edu ERCC, which stands for Educational Rights uh, Collective of Canada, that represents the rights of the broadcasters. So, I guess I should first and foremost say that if you record something off television and bring it into the classroom and play it, that's not legal. There is a collective that represents those rights, um, and they cover. Uh, uh, there's, some, there's some provisions I should go through, I guess, in, in talking about that. First of all, um, for news and news commentary. So, if you record a newscast or you record a, a news commentary uh, uh, program, such as Larry King, etc., 
Uh, you can record that material and use it in the classroom for a period of up to one year without paying any rights. Um, you can also record something off television and preview it and, and examine it for up to 30 days, uh, at which time, point in time you're supposed to either pay the rights if you're going to use it or erase the tape. Um, there's a tariff associated with, with the uh, recording if you're going to keep it and use it. So that would apply if you recorded something and were going to use it in class beyond, you know, after you had previewed it, or if you're going to use a news program or a news commentary program for a period exceeding the one year uh, where you can use it at no charge. And the, the charge for that is $2 per minute. Or if it's a radio program, an audio program, it would be 17 cents per minute. Uh, they do allow, as my, as my understanding is, you can edit the material. So if you recorded a one-hour program but you only wanted to use 15 minutes of it, you would pay the $2 per minute on the 15 minutes, not on the full one hour. So it's whatever we actually keep and use. And so there's, there are more ins uh, instructions about all that on the uh, IMS website. There's a contact uh, name if you want to have something recorded for this purpose, or if you record it yourself, there's a contact person to, to deal with the issue of trying to clear it. Uh, there's a fair amount of information that you should keep when you record it, such as the date of the recording, the time, the uh, station from which it was recorded, and uh, the name of the program and the duration. Um, it, this applies to any legally acquired broadcast, so it can be via over-the-air cable, satellite, etc. Um, the web is a little more confusing, but you know, sort of fits in. If, if you had recorded it off the web, it's sort of I think the same rules tend to apply. Um, to this date, I'm not aware of anybody actually going through and actually doing this. It's uh, when we get to the point about how much it's going to cost, people usually say it's not worth it, etc. So, and and the often material that is of interest to you for use in class does become available through uh, Ingrid's um, resources through some distributor that probably picks up the program and makes it possible for them to be uh, purchased with, pu with public performance rights. Because many of these programs that are broadcast over television, if they're of interest to a post-secondary audience, tend to, be, to, first of all, they're not the property of the broadcaster. They're probably, they've been produced by somebody else and, and then aired and they often become available through educational distributors. So those are generally the rules of off-air. Um, I've been asked a number of times over years about what you know, to do about the use of clips, and we've, we've you know, never came to any, any clear decision or discussion about that. But in looking at the fair dealing provisions that I talked about before, there is an argument to be made if you're just using a short piece of a work which doesn't represent a substantial portion of the work and just you know displaying it for criticism purposes that it could be covered under fair dealing. So if, you, if you're using something like a one or two minute clip, you may want to talk to me and, and get some advice. Uh, there may be a, you know, and there are probably lots of people that won't agree with me, including lawyers, but you know, there's probably lots of others under the, on the fair dealing side of things that would say that this could very well be fair dealing. So we can talk about the use of clips. So the use of clips in the classroom, depending on their length and nature and how they're being used, could be, could be fair dealing. The use of clips on CUTV is a different matter because CUTV broadcasts. Any questions on off air? Yes. Is there a difference between uh, teaching and conference presentation in terms of like, these uh, rules? We tend to apply the same rules uh, for teaching in, in conferences. Um, certainly Access Copyright uh, looks at it that way, and so we, we tend to do that as well. It's, we, we almost treat a conference the same as, as what happens in the classroom. So I don't know that, yeah, I'm not saying that's necessarily that it is totally legal or whatnot, but uh, that's generally the interpretation. I've certainly never heard of anybody 
being taken to task, in this country at least, on using material in a conference. There have been issues in the United States with the Digital uh, Media Copyright Act, where a guy got thrown in jail because of presenting his research, because he was making digital copies of, and reverse engineering. But we don't have that yet in Canada. Uh, that country. If you're going to the U.S., you might want to double check what you're doing. <laughs> so, I'll leave some business cards uh, at the at the door before anyone goes. There was another question. In some countries, there are laws which are not followed, and openly the photocopy the whole book that's that's not the law in Canada <laughs> we follow the law in Canada so yeah there are, you know depending on the country there are various things we have agreements with other countries and the agreements generally are that um, if we bring material in from another country our rules apply within our country and that's and that and vice versa so that's that's how the rules work so our, our legislation isn't the, exactly the same as that of Australia or, or United States or Britain or Russia, but our rules apply here when we bring their material in and, and the same there. So in some ways, um, academics have more freedom to use material in the classroom, especially audiovisual material in the U.S. than we do in Canada, even though it may have been produced in Canada, but that's the way the rules work. Yes? If the material is available on the web and you believe it's legally there, then you can provide them with that link and they can view that at their own discretion because that's private study, really. And what about the podcasts made available by webcasters? Same thing. It's, so yeah, so if you if you provide if you produce the link for people to go to it, that's fine. If you make a copy of it, that's a different issue. Um, yeah. But what if you think podcasts are fine? Off the web, that's okay. Yeah. So you're playing it from the web, correct? Yeah. That's okay. So far. <laughs> Okay, uh, what are we moving on to alternate formats? And Heather. For alternate formats, our, uh, our university has a lot of students with disabilities and um, the library has a service whereby we, uh, the Paul Metten Center, will refer students to us to have material converted to an alternate format for these students who can't read regular print. And, uh, and right away, I'll introduce you to the person who takes care of this service. It's Pamela Williamson right here. And um, so what would happen would be the Paul, the Paul Metten Center would send a student to Pamela and uh, they would ask Pamela to convert their textbook to an alternate format. So they might want it in audio, they might want it in braille or electronic text. And according to the Copyright Act, Section 32, um, this is fine because the Act makes an exception for people with disabilities that, um, that they can have their material reproduced into an alternate format. And as uh, we act on the student's behalf, and so um, we're able to do that for them. The only thing that we're not allowed to do, according to the Copyright Act, is large print. And then Ross has been talking about the Access Copyright Agreement that we have, and um, it does make uh, an allowance 
for us to have things reproduced into large print. Um, we don't do all this reproducing here at the university. What we do is um, the Ontario government funds a service through W. Ross MacDonald School, which is a school for the blind in Brantford, Ontario. And we are just the go-between between the this school for the blind that has a, a library full of alternate format materials. And the students come to us and we pass the orders on to W. Ross MacDonald School. They have a library uh, with alternate formats and first of all what we do is we look in their database to find out if the textbook is, has already been converted to an alternate format. If it has been, then what we do is we just um, put an order through and ask them for a copy of the alternate format to be sent to us and we in turn give it to the student. If the orders or if the alternate format isn't available there, then our library will buy a copy of the textbook um, through our acquisitions department. and. Um, and we have, uh, the library absorbs the cost for those textbooks and sends them off to, uh, through W. Ross to be converted into the alternate format that the student requires. Um, it can take a long time to have these orders processed. And so if there's any professors here, then this is a good time, I guess, for us to make a plea that um, the sooner that you can um, let your office administrators know what textbook you're using for each semester, that's, that's really, uh, that would help us out a lot. Because we need at least a couple of months to be able to um, have a book processed and sent away to W. Ross and have it processed and returned to us so that we can give the student what they need by uh, September, for, for instance. There are many other uh, electronic resources uh, in our library that are helping out a lot. So, for instance, we have electronic books and electronic journals, and we have journal article searching databases that we that students can use with screen re with uh, screen readers that they have on their uh, computers so any kind of electronic resource that's available like uh, WebCT for instance is a, has been a great help to students with disabilities because the student can listen to all the resources that you make available uh, through WebCT with a screen reader we do have a piece of software in the Joy McLaren Adaptive Technology Center which is called Kurzweil 3000 and that software can convert regular print to electronic text. So if for instance a student um, is doing a paper and they need to have a couple of chapters from a book or a journal article that is not already in electronic format, then they can use this software in the Joy McLaren Center. If they, for because of their disability, are not able to do their own scanning and conversion to electronic format, then um, we have student employees who work in the Joy McLaren Center and they um, will do the conversion for the students who need it. Um, the other thing, Ross has talked a lot about regular photocopying and all the limits there are on photocopying. For students with disabilities, there really aren't any limits. So a student could, or a student or somebody on their behalf, can go down to the photocopy center in the library. They can take uh, a book off our shelves and they could have the whole book uh, photocopied. It's because this is because, depending on a person's disability, it might not be suitable for them or it might not be easy for them to read a textbook uh, in our library. And so we just make it as easy as possible. And the Section 32 of the Copyright Act does allow for um, pretty much unlimited photocopying for students with disabilities. So I think. 
That's about it. Questions? Perfectly clear. <laughs> For everybody. Mm -hmm. We're going to move on to uh, classroom presentation. And in general, uh, things that you may do in the classroom include uh, producing overhead transparencies, though not very much anymore, more likely to be electronic presentations like PowerPoint or slides. Um, you are allowed to make copies of works for display purposes in the classroom. There's a, there's a uh, provision within the Act that basically says you can make, I mean, the way it reads, it sort of applies to an overhead projector, but it says there are other similar device, and we have certainly determined that data projectors are, are a similar device and, in fact, in most cases have replaced the overhead projector. Um, the only caveat is that the work must not be commercially available, and this particular primarily applies to slides in, in the art history world where they are selling slides uh, as collections for, for art history purposes, and so they don't want to uh, impact on that market. Uh, um, it, this does not include posting to the website, so you can, ha you can put anything you want up on your PowerPoint presentation in the classroom, but putting it up on the website is making a copy that's, that then can be copied by others, so you're starting to become basically a publisher to, make, to uh, distribute the work. And so it gets a little dicey on the issue of, of putting up the PowerPoint on your, your uh, web CT presentation, or uh, site. And so some of the comments are that password protecting uh, the site, which is what happens with WebCT, still doesn't mean that you can actually make the copy for distribution purposes, uh, or domain restrictions, the same thing, or emailing the work to the students is basically you've turned yourself into a publisher or, and are distributing the material. Because remember back at the beginning, the only person that has the right to distribute or to make copies is the copyright holder themselves. So one needs to be sort of somewhat vigilant about what one puts up on a, on a, on a website. And so the easiest thing is to, uh, to clear the rights or to find some alternatives where the, the work is, is freely available or to look at our fair dealing provisions. And so the fair dealing provisions let the students you know, make copies, again from a legal copy, but that doesn't give you the right to put it up on your website as an intermediary and, and then let them copy from there. So they should go to the source, which hopefully, and we'll talk about what's available through the library, but the best way is to sort of work through the library and let people uh, make copies from that source. Uh, on the alternatives, you'll find I've given you a number of examples in the handout of, of alternative places where you can go and find works that are, you know, copyright free or copyright available for educational purposes. So I'll move on into library reserves, etc. with Ingrid. There are a couple ways that my work touches on um, digital copying. Um, I'll talk about the interlibrary loan um, method first. We, we, in the last couple of years, have been using a, um, a, a safe sort of legal program to be able to send um, articles and chapters that you request through interlibrary loan digitally. Um, um, some of you may have heard about the landmark case with the Law Society of Upper Canada and a publisher, CCH. Um, they, um, the Law Society of Upper Canada was, uh, most of their clientele did not come to their library. Um, they faxed material out to them and that's the, where the challenge arose with the publisher. Um, it went right to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court deemed that it was um, other media, it was the fax was, was an okay way to transmit that. So that opened things wide up and, and some libraries um, went really far in interpreting that and um, I went to library conferences where they advocated maybe don't renew your access copyright um, license that we have a carte blanche to start um, copying digitally, that sort of thing. Most libraries said no, I don't think so. But we have um, dipped into this world a bit and one of the ways is um, through interlibrary loans. We have a product called Relay Express 
which allows us to send something digitally, a link to people's email, that they can look at something once or copy it once and then it gets destroyed. So they can't make multi-copy. So it sort of protects that one copy for research provision. Um, when we either scan print material to send it out this way or if it arrives to us digitally, we send it out digitally now. So we no longer have people picking up paper articles um, in the library. They get it sent to them and they can print it at their own desktop. Um, so that's uh, a service that we provide. It's working very, very well. Um, we've had the odd person that hasn't been able to to look at it or, or um, they looked at it once and then they couldn't open it again, we can, you can contact us and we can send it to you again if you missed that opportunity. Um, any questions about that? Another way that my work touches on uh, digital um, access is um, I'm the head of access services and one point of access is um, who has access to our electronic resources. And our licensing um, guidelines say that only um, current Carleton students, staff, and faculty have access. And the word current is very important there. Um, when people graduate, they don't understand that all of a sudden they're cut off from all our um, e-resources um, overnight. Um, and it's because they're no longer current. Um, so protecting that um, access and, and making sure that we are um, honoring our licensing agreements, we have to be very vigilant about what people are doing. Um, we have all these digital resources. The same rules apply um, in terms of downloading, very small amounts of the material, the same as it would be for print. Um, and don't think that people aren't watching. Um, vendors and consortiums are monitoring how much is being downloaded. And I can tell you this because people have been, um, the whole community was cut off more than once because somebody at Carleton was copying, downloading an entire book. So we were all shut down. And I get to know who that person is. And I get to have the job to contact them and tell them that they have um, infringed our licensing agreement and copyright and they need to stop immediately because they're actually, the whole community is being punished. So it is very important to follow the same guidelines as you would for print with any kind of digital downloading that you're doing. Um, some people have fancy programs, they can do it in minutes, but there, there is, um, these are being monitored. Um, and um, they, will, they will find you out um, right to your email. So um, it's very, very important to us. Um, to, you know, we, we sign these licenses. Um, we have to follow the rules. So um, that's, um, and unless anybody has questions about that, that's what I wanted to say. So this is probably the last thing about the book I'm using next to is available at the library, but only the online version that's not the paper version. Yes. Click um, the specific chapter and, and and read it um, at your home, at your office, or whatnot. So some are limited to maybe four users at a time, but that will specify in the catalog. Mm -hmm. So you're not typically signing it out, you're just clicking on the link and it'll take you to the separate database. Okay, okay good. Okay, so hello, my, my name again is Joanne Rummig. Um, I have some cards up front and some handouts. Our new re, uh, reserve request form, simplified, and a copy of the letter that I had just sent out to faculty members last week for the winter 2010 submissions. Um, just basically, what can be placed on reserve? Books from our own collection. Okay, so if you were to come in and you re request a book that you are going to be using or would like students to use in your class, we can set that book on reserve. A photocopied article not available electronically. If you have an article that you have researched somewhere and you want a paper copy, we can put that on reserve. What we urge you to do in that case though is to have a copy, a clean copy for yourself. Just keep, um, retain the original. 
what happens, we had a uh, case this term where the original was lost and unfortunately it was, it was something a prophet received in Europe, so it didn't have another copy. Okay. 10% uh, of a book that is not available in our collection or one chapter. Okay. As well, um, we can play CD, CD-ROMs and DVDs on reserve. Instructor's copy of a textbook or a personal book, we will cover in red paper and place that on reserve either for two or four hours under the copyright agreement. Those books we do not allow to go out of the library simply because they are not our copy. Okay, they're your own personal copy. This year we'll also put on your personal material such as course outlines, lecture notes, or handwritten assignment solutions. Okay, so if you are in an area that you would like your students to have access to that, we can either put the paper form on or um, create a PDF and attach it to your course reserves list. Course packs can now be placed on reserve under access copyright, but we will specify that no copying of the material is permitted. Uh, we would appreciate if you would let your students know as well and kind of spread the word on that. And complete issues of periodicals, government docs, and reference materials are not placed on reserve. They are available in-house only for all students, and we can definitely let them know where the material can be found, but they, they don't normally go on reserve. What we're starting to add more and more are electronic reserves. So journal articles from our database can now be placed on reserve electronically. This has shown to be a huge benefit for students. Not only can they request it 24-7, either from home, their workplace, or whatnot, um, but they will get a clean copy each time. So we eliminate the issue of students taking copies from the library or taking parts of. We've had issues this term, students have walked off with part of the copies or mixed up um, assignment solutions and whatnot. And so we've been working with profs to clear that up. For any requests that require copyright permission, please allow an extra three to five weeks for processing. Okay. If there is a cost, we will come to you. If not, it may take that long for us to work with a publisher and or the author. Okay. So just a couple of reminders, please retain original copies of any personal materials and if any submission is not covered under access copyright guidelines, then we will contact you to discuss alternatives. So we do check to make sure that everything is covered under access copyright and yeah, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. This is to be placed on reserve. But reserve, you can photocopy 10% of the book. Yes. And 5% is for distribution to the class? Yeah, hand out to the class, multiple hand out. So I mean, if you want to get technical, you can, you can have 10% of the work put on reserve in the library, and of course, each student can make their own copy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They can do that. Yes. Yep. Yeah, they're allowed yep. So we can go study. through you to get the 10% of the book. Exactly. And students actually prefer one spot for all materials. So what we're hearing from uh, faculty and students, it's helpful if they can come in to look at their course reserve list and see all items there. And then that way they can just print off their list there. Any questions? Yeah. Sir, where did the 5% number? 5% is for textbooks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Page one. I know. Okay. But for general, there works 10%. Place it even says 20% of the total chapter of book not exceeding 20% of the total. That's right, that's another So there's different, you know, yeah, I mean, a chapter can exceed the 5 or 10% rule as long as it doesn't go past 20%. Yeah. Yeah. And keeping in mind, too, anything that you place on WebCT may or may not be covered under copyright. So it's better to, if you can go through library reserves, then we will ensure that it is covered under copyright for you. No, we put it under your course reserve list yeah. at this point. We're looking at different software systems that may be able to link up, but right now we'll provide the course off our website. So just to be sure, if I have, have an article that I want to send to students that's available through the library database, this mm -hmm. is just to be circulation, instead of putting on electronic reserves and not on the No, exactly. Come through us. Okay. okay. But you can post the link on the website. Mm -hmm.
So the guarantee for January, we asked that it'll be in December. And, and but then it goes on to say in early September. Oh, sorry, in early January. So just a quick reminder on computer software that uh, every copy of software needs to be uh, legal and so that you only copying you can do of software is you can make a single copy for backup purposes uh, so that it means if you have a hard drive crash or whatever or the, the disk that it all comes on is uh, gets damaged you at least have a, a, a backup but that's the only copying that can be made of, of computer software. Uh, for theses, there are uh, general rules. The best thing is just if students are asking about the, uh, a thesis issue, uh, first point is to send them to either of the two websites that I have cited. In general, um, the, the student owns the, the thesis publication, the rights to the thesis. Uh, it just gets a little complicated because there is publications, technically sort of publication involved on a certain level because the copy of the thesis goes into the McCodrum Library. Another copy goes to the National Library where it's basically available for one and all. Uh, but mostly, mostly the people that go for those are people who are writing other theses. Um, so all the rules are sort of are, are available on those websites and uh, certainly you can uh, send students to me with questions. Where it gets murky is use of other people's works within the thesis. Okay, on the legislation front, um, there are certainly a lot of discussion about where, what's legal digitally, what's legal as far as the use of the web, etc., and uh, making digital copies and, and distribution. And the government has come close on several occasions, and I mean, there have been actually draft legislation from time to time uh, put forward which because of the political situation we're in with minority governments uh, falling all the time and elections getting called, the legislation dies because everything before Parliament uh, ends up on the order to, you know, uh, gets prorogued and uh, dies and after the next election they have to start over again. Current government has started over again on, uh, in their, their drafting legislation. They have public uh, consultations uh, during the summer this year, uh, and certainly there were, they got a lot of feedback from, from consumers, from uh, educational organizations, uh, rights holders and rights uh, publishers, and I have probably a lot more opinions than they ever will need and want. Uh, where this will lead is hard to say. Uh, it's, it's difficult in a minority government situation to get something like a copyright pass through. It's controversial legislation just as, as a matter of course because there's two sides to the issue. There's two federal government departments involved. There's Industry Canada and uh, uh, Canadian Heritage. Uh, one tends to represent one side and one the other. And in a minority government it's very difficult to get consensus. Um, and once they do sort of get consensus, they, you know, often the government fails before it makes it through the whole process. But it is possible there might be some legislation coming forward by Christmas or early in the new year. And if the government uh, actually, you know, makes it through like another year, it could, you know, there could be some, some progress made on legislation. Um, that's about all I can say. It's, it's very hazy and fuzzy and, you know, we're being criticized as falling behind. but. In some ways, it's not so bad because it means we can continue to do what we have been doing. Um, on the handouts, we've given information on, on everybody that's uh, presented today, and uh, I, we've given you uh, web links as well to our, our various areas. And uh, there are business cards available if you want to, to take those home with you. And I'll just open it up for general questions before I invite you to have a muffin before you leave. Yes? Uh, I have a question about uh, classroom presentation. Yes. Uh, if I ask IMS to paint my deck, I want to post it on WebCT. Yes. Do the slides that I have to say, say my slides contain copyright that works, but it was available by me. I, I'm using it legally for the class presentation, but now I'm painting my lecture, and I want to put 
lecture on web scene. Now, you, you, because you said that you, you cannot put those slides up on the web CT, right? But now I'm putting a video tape on my lecture, mm -hmm. which shows all the slides, basically. Mm -hmm. I guess I would say if you if you could find some way of making it either impossible or very difficult for people to make copies of the recording that you put on your web CT site, in other words, if you're viewing only but not for copying, then that probably would be okay. For public dis for public distribution, I don't think that would be a good idea. <laughs> I, I don't know how MIT does it because they, they take lectures all the time and they put it up on the web for, for everyone to see. Maybe they have some clearances. Well, there's, there's two things, I guess, about MIT. First of all, they're following American law and not Canadian law. And so they, there is a little more leeway in what you can do in the classroom in the U.S. But secondly, MIT, I think, paid millions of dollars material, so they may have actually cleared those rights, because the, the MIT stuff that goes up on the website just didn't happen free. They spent millions doing that. So I suspect that they actually paid the rights for that. I mean, you know, you could, you know, you could also ask the copyright holders for permission. I know it takes time and effort, but you could do that. Yeah, it's... I mean, it, there might be a fair dealing provision. I don't know. It's 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 kind of a gray area, but you know, this the safest thing is to use your own stuff. <laughs> um, but you know, having said all that, I mean, we're we're looking at the concept of uh, of possibly putting the you know equipment in a classroom where you could record what's happening in the classroom and make it available for for students at a later date. And so we have to think about whether indeed doing that and restricting it, let's say, to the students of the course, um, where they only view the material. And I come back to this thing, if, if it's a matter of, you know, re reviewing the material at a later date but not making copies of it, uh, it's probably fair dealing. But we'd have to, we have to put in some kind of provision where we get the students to agree they won't copy it and try and make it difficult at least. I mean, no, there's no such thing as making it impossible, but you know, try to make it at least difficult for someone to make a copy, so it's primarily there for, for review purposes and, and looking at. I mean, who wants to make copies of it anyway? Let's be serious. You know? <laughs> yes? Um, I'm just looking at the, uh, the title for the whole presentation, Copy and Clear Conscience, and that you're so concerned for my conscience. Um, uh, but I'm assuming that what you really mean is, is legal liability. And the question I have is how, you know, where does that liability ultimately reside uh, in an institutional setting such as your own? So what happens if you get sued? Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, not, I'm so. not that concerned because it, it, it makes sense to always follow the money. <laughs> you know, you would waste their time suing. Uh, uh, but uh, so if you, I, I'm certain. I have kind of because there are lots of parts in all of this. I mean, you know, I make some photocopies. I, I walk walk them down the hall to, to, a, to an administrator or to a student who scans them, who then uh, emails them to EDC, who helps put them up on web CT. You know, they, well, So that's one of the reasons we have this session is provide people with, with guidelines and, and re, uh, resources and support about what we believe is legal and what isn't legal. There's a lot of gray areas in, in, in the legalities of it. If someone felt that what we were doing was illegal, I mean, the first thing they would do is they would ask us to cease and desist. I mean, they're not going to, you know, the first step is not to sue us. Well, they might ask you, or they might ask the president, or the you know the, the university as a whole, or whatever. They would contact someone, or they would, if it's an access copyright issue, they would contact uh, Carol Miles, who is the official contact for the access copyright agreement. So, uh, and so we would deal with the cease and desist decision as to whether we think it's legal or not, and whether we want to fight it or not. And in most cases, probably the simplest thing is just to pull back, unless we think we have a real good case. Um, I mean, if it actually got to the point of suing and whatnot, I mean, you know, ultimately the university bears responsibility 
unless you as a faculty member went completely rogue on us and just ignored everything we told you and, you know, <laughs> and decided, you know, you knew better. And then that might get a little messy. But in general, you know, you would be supported by the university that you were following the rules that the university deems as being appropriate. And then, I mean, it becomes a legal battle and issue, and the university does have insurance, I mean, t at, the buy at the end of the day. But there aren't, you know, there aren't many lawsuits in Canada over this, but there's, but there's certainly, you know, you cease and desist can take place. Does that sort of help? Well, it helps me to, to uh, just sort of a thumbnail risk assessment, because in some cases you're asking me to Heroic yeah. Lie with the law, with, with the legal yeah. Feel free at any time to contact me or anyone else here about, for advice, and when you you know you're not sure what you think you should be doing, and whatnot, and and we'll give you what you know our best interpretation is of, of where we're at and what the best course of action is to take. I don't have an office, <laughs> so, so you can contact me by phone or by email. If you want to see me, I can come in, but you know, most, most of the time we can sort it out either verbally or in writing. <laughs> you mentioned a couple of times uh, for academic purposes, and you know, when a student puts his thesis, uh, and in the cases, because this thing came across, somebody from some other country asked me that if they can use a questionnaire which is at the end of the thesis for their own purposes, for academic purposes, like this student is also doing PhD and he wanted to use the questionnaire of another PhD who is already completed, whose thesis is on thematic. So in those situations, is it for academic purposes this other student is asking? I would say if they were going to just copy the whole thing and make no changes and whatnot, they should really ask permission. Permission from the author? Yes. I know, so, and, you know, and you may or may not be able to contact them, but you, sh you should at least try. Because the they probably would say yes. No, it yeah. was my student who said no, no to other students from other countries. Well, and if they say no, that's it, you know. It's, uh, said, they have the right. They have the right to say no because they wrote. If they wrote the questionnaire and somebody else wants to use it, uh, they have the right to say yes or no as to whether that's valid. But if it is a publisher, not a student, in this, and if the publisher says it's okay to use for academic purposes, like let's say if that thing is not published in the form of a book chapter, and and, uh, and it, it says that you can use it for uh, your academic purposes. Then can somebody use that question? If it's for academic purposes, yeah. Doing if they and going out yeah. of the university, is it academic purposes? Like out to the general population to do a survey, or? Well, if it's for if it's for research purposes yeah. within the university, yes, yeah. Okay, so I'm, as I say, feel free to contact us at any time with specific questions or at this point in time and whatnot. And thank you all for coming, and uh, hope you have a great week. <laughs>